Today, we are thrilled to uh, welcome uh, Gail back uh, to talk to us about one of her favorite topics uh, after the assessment, ideas about AIM classroom implementation. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite Gail uh, to, to start telling us about what we're going to do with our AIM once we get it. Gail, welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to say that I do love this topic, and I think it's so important that um, that we address it. I was so glad to see it included in this um, eight-part AIM series, because I think one of our um, most common errors as we work through either the use of a student's use of assistive technology or or use of accessible educational materials or both, is that we we do a really good job ahead of time of, um, of defining what it is we're doing, of assessing what it is we're doing or what the student needs and considering. Even if we don't do a good job, we have good words for how to, um, how we do that and what it might look like if we're doing a uh, good aim assessment and consideration. <laughs> what I do think is that sometimes, um, as a friend of mine said to me just a couple of days ago, sometimes we are inclined to say, okay, we got it. Here's your aim. Now go forth and learn. Or to teachers, we say, here's your aim. Now go forth and teach. So, um, I, I was really excited today to be invited to do this topic after the assessment. What do we do after the assessment um, to, to think about how we get the AIM working for kids in classrooms, both working for kids and working for teachers. So that's our big picture for today is what's next? Um, that, that's the top of the uh, title I use when I talk to parents about this concept is, okay, I've got AIM, what's next? Um, this is my bi biography information, my disclosures and, and um, a little bit about me. If you haven't heard this already, I'd be very surprised because I've been, it's been fun to be part of this, this series and many of the other activities that OTAP's been doing. But um, do know that I am a teacher by training. So when I look at any kind of activity, I do look at it from a, from a teacher's eye and a classroom eye. And I think uh, that in collaboration with some of the wonderful people that that I get to work with who are OTs and, and speech and language clinicians and assistive technology specialists of all kinds really makes for some, some exciting and, and vibrant um, thinking. And that my uh, that's one of my favorite things to do is look at a problem from all angles and see how we can address it differently. Um, in several of the webinars that we've had before in this series, you've heard pretty extensive descriptions of what accessible educational materials are. So this is a, uh, the definition that we're using most commonly, and I wanted to particularly talk about the acronym Accessible Educational Materials. Um, accessible educational materials are print and technology-based educational materials, including printed and electronic textbooks and related core materials, other materials that are required by state education agencies and local education agencies for use by all students. And I won't read you all the rest of those words. But what I do want to call attention to, just so that you make sense uh can make sense out of this is if you're thinking i thought it used to be a i m you are correct the wording in idea idea at this moment and the wording that we used for a number of years was accessible 
instructional materials. And we use that term uh, for the first time when it was included in IDEA in 2004, where it really was limited to four specialized formats, print and uh, braille and large print and digital. So, um, oh, and audio, I'm sorry. So this effort to expand and think more deeply about educational materials led to a change in the acronym, but not in the pronunciation. So if you've been wondering about that, uh, we say aim for both things, but the term that we're most commonly using is accessible educational materials. And you can see the, the statute here where that is um, a citation, but it is not does not say accessible educational materials in IDEA. So if anybody asks, it's just a change in terminology and we haven't modified that law for 20 years now. So that's important, I think, to understand. Another thing that I wanted to remind you of that you've seen probably in every uh, AIM for Inclusion video that we've done is the definition of accessibility because we're really going to focus on how, how we can begin to think about having accessible classrooms in, in this webinar. And then we'll be looking at next time at a bunch of resources for helping with that classroom accessibility. Accessibility means that a person with a disability can acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally effective, equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. Now that this is a, a chart, a slide that you will see in many, many AIM presentations, but this is our goal for AIM integration. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's so important to talk about implementation, because what you see here on the left, acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, enjoy the same services, are all things that happen after the assessment. So as we're doing assessment, we're beginning to think about, you know, how can we make this true for an individual with a disability? But until we actually put it into place in a classroom, we're unlikely to really know all the ins and outs of it. So we have to think about classroom implementation. And I think, and I think there are several big ideas um, that we can use to help us think about how do we make this happen? I was mentioning to Deb before the webinar started that um, I have done many um, full day workshops about AIM for implementation or about AT implementation. And what are the things we need to think when a student is using assistive technology in a classroom setting? And I think that the, um, the concepts and a lot of the big ideas apply also to AIM, although they may need some slight modification or some uh, tweaking a little bit to make sure that they are um, applied in a manner that makes sense for our kids who need uh, accessible educational materials. So these are the four, four big ideas that we're gonna talk about today in our webinar time. The first one is that AIM implementation has changed. And I wanna, I'll talk about that in a little, in a minute, but also effective AIM implementation plans are specific. We, we need to make plans once we've selected our accessible educational materials, and the student has been hopefully involved in that selection and has the skills they need to use it, but that's not enough um, because AIM must be integrated 
And then we need to have evidence that AIM makes a difference, makes the difference that we were hoping it would make. So I've pulled some information about each of these big ideas into our, into our webinar time today. And I want to invite you uh, anytime you want. If you're interested in this topic or learning more about it, uh, there's lots and lots to say about classroom implementation and classroom management of assistive technology and AIM. Um, and I really do like talking about this topic. So uh, give me a call or, or send me an email and let's talk if, if some of this information really um, makes sense to you. So let's start with the first one, AIM implementation. Implementation is change. One of the, th when I first started doing work on imp classroom implementation with assistive technology and with AIM, I went to a friend of mine who was a school OT and I said, well, what, what is it that teachers need to know? What do people need to know about implementing? the AT program or the AIM program. And she said, oh, it just changes everything. And she she really couldn't go any farther than that in our conversation. But she really did make me think about the fact that anytime we're putting new devices, new tools, new resources into a classroom or into a student's educational program, we are asking the people involved in that educational program to change what they do. So let me give you a for instance. I want you to uh, look at the place that that you're sitting or standing if you stand during, during Zoom meetings today. And just take a look around you and see what your room looks like. And then here's your instruction. I am a, a office, home office consultant, and I am coming in to tell you that you need to turn your table or your desk that you're sitting at around 180 degrees so that you're sitting on the exact opposite side of it and make it work in the room where you're sitting. Now, many of you, what, uh, let me ask you, type in the chat. What are your thoughts if I say that? You have to move your desk, turn it around 180 degrees. What are the kinds of things that makes you think of as I say that? <laughs> Brett says, why? Like, who are you to tell me that? I think that's a very good question. And it's a question that teachers often ask us when we're um, talking about inserting uh, assistive technology or AIM into a student's environment. So it's a question we ask a lot. We answer a lot. Uh, Sarah says that's a huge change. It's going to, uh, Sarah, if I can put words in your mouth, I can imagine that you're sad. Chandra says it's a huge pain, which is probably what Sarah was saying more, was but more gently. Um, it is a huge change, and it is a huge pain. Um, so, what I what I want to point out is that that kind of a request is the kind of request that often we as specialists put into action whenever we are talking about inserting or helping a student use assistive technology or accessible educational materials in an educational program. And if we had a little more time, we could, you know, we could go through all sorts of things that people might say. One of the things we know though, is that if you buy into, I'm a good, uh, a home office consultant, and you really need to do what I say because I'm, you know, well known for my skills in home office. Then the next thing that happens when we ask people to make change is that we have to make sense out of it. 
So imagine for just a, you don't have to move your desk, I promise. But imagine for just a minute that you did buy into this change. You said, oh, I can see how this would be good for me and it would give me a whole new perspective on the world and all that kind of stuff. And then what we know happens is that we have to begin to make sense out of the change we're asked to make. So if you talk about flipping your, moving your desk 180 degree, around 180 degrees, then some of the things that you're going to have to be doing are figuring out, well, I can move it 180 degrees, but then what do I do with all this stuff that's on the far side of the desk that's up against the wall? And how far away from the wall do I need to be? And and there's furniture, other furniture that's going to need to be moved if I'm going to do that. You can imagine the kinds of things you might be thinking when, when even if you buy into the need for this as a uh, huge pain. And Devin says, you have to make the need for change have a purpose or it's going to be discarded or ignored. And that's exactly the point that I'm hoping to make. It has to be meaningful to the people that we're asking to change. And more, I think that the meaning that we sometimes assume is this will be helpful for this individual kid. But unless we begin to have some conversations about more than one individual kid, but how the, um, the use of AIM is gonna affect a classroom, affect other kids in the classroom, affect what the teacher has to do and things like that, then we we haven't helped the people that we work with and the people we're asking to make, to use AIM, um, to make meaning out of what we're asking them to do. And I really think that a lot of that has to be done up front. One of the things that um, that I think it has um, has been true is that sometimes a lot of the assessment and initial trial period stuff that we do with kids um, for accessible educational materials is done without the uh, input or the inclusion of the the general education teacher who's going to really have to implement it. It, it often happens with the uh, special educators in the, in the building or in the program. And then we, we think we've done them a favor by figuring it all out for them and handing them a well-designed AIM package and a well-designed um, set of AIM ideas and concepts. What I really believe is that because change is personal, because we have to ha react to it in familiar, reliable construction of reality, we need involvement as soon as possible from the people who will be implementing the AIM. So sometimes it's not possible immediately to involve um, a fifth grade teacher in the in the selection and acquisition process. But as soon as possible, the people who are going to be implementing need to, to be involved in the change. And the further away we are from that, the more likely uh, the, the plan will fail uh, if people aren't involved and they haven't made meaning out of it. So we've had a lot of OTEP aim for inclusion topics. Um, we've talked about what does IDEA say about aim? What are aim formats? How does assistive technology relate to aim? Why are accessible formats needed? Where do you get them? And what about teacher made materials? Today we're doing implementation and next time we're gonna be doing resources for um, for finding and using accessible educational materials. All of those things imply a change in how, how we do things, but also imply a change 
in um, how teachers do things. So these are these webinar titles were pretty much all formatted as questions. And I think sometimes the answers we're looking at require us to make a change in our practice or how we do things. And in order to really get um, buy-in for those kinds of changes, we need to have people that uh, the educators involved as much as possible from as from as close to the beginning as possible. Another big picture idea about AT implementation is that effective implementation plans are specific. Um, an implementation plan that says uh, Julio will use digital text to get information from his science curriculum is, isn't enough for a teacher to really know how to implement. So we need to be specific about goals, about what the objectives are, and how AIM gets integrated into curriculum instruction. There's a lot of good ideas about how to integrate AIM into instruction, but the one I wanted to, um, to share with you today in our, in our brief time together was that we really have to first think about the purpose and expected results of AIM implementation. So let's take a look at a, a really um, official statement. I don't know exactly who it's officially from, but um, purpose and expected results of AIM implementation. The purpose of AIM implementation is that students will use AIM to actively participate in curricular and extracurricular activities in an equally effective, equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. Now, remember that chart that we looked at very early on in this webinar, that one that defined accessibility. And here you have our goal and our purpose for using AIM so that students can get there can participate in the same ways that their peers do. The result of that participation and the result of um, that effective, equally integrated ease of use is that we should see students have increased academic achievement and functional performance. So functional performance being maybe some of the things that aren't normally um, tested with, uh, you know, standardized tests or, or text, tests out of the textbook or something like that. Um, I want to look at the chat. So Shannon, I see, said earlier on that the what's essential for all is beneficial, essential for a few is beneficial to all. And the learner is uh, is often not included either in this conversation. Um, so I please feel free to interrupt me. I can't see everything today. I can't see all of you and my slides at the same time. But feel free to unmute yourself if you want to chime in or if you have thoughts or ideas about the kinds of concepts we're gonna work on today. So one of the ways I think that we can really plan for AIM implementation is to use this idea. Many of you I'm sure are familiar with the SET framework, which was developed initially by our dear friend, Joy Zabala. Um, and when, I was beginning to work on an AIM implementation uh, framework and then AT implementation framework. I had long conversations with Joy about how do, what do we do after the assessment? Because again, the set framework, if it's taken on its face, has often been used just as an assessment tool. 
And we talked and talked and talked. And one night over a very good bottle of wine, we we realized that what has to happen after you've chosen the accessible educational materials for an individual student and you've got kind of a um, package in place is that we have to take a second look at the set framework. So we eventually called it the idea of resetting, taking a second look at the student, at the environment, at the tasks and the tools to see. But in this case, we want to know how things will change for each of these um, letters in the acronym. So how would things change for the student? How will the environment need to change in order to, to get to make AIM an easy and integrated part of a classroom uh, on a daily basis? What tasks have to be done differently? What has to be, tasks have to be done differently by this, by this teacher? And what tasks have to be done differently by the uh, student? And then finally, how do we evaluate the use of these tools to make sure that we're really accomplishing the goals? So for the rest of our, most of the rest of our time together, we're going to talk about this idea of resetting and have seeing student environment tests and tools change. And I want to just give you some big picture ideas that you can run with if they make sense to you. If you want to, again, talk to me more about um, implementation and a focus on any of these big picture ideas, again, feel free to contact me. When we talk about student change, um, we go back to a paradigm that is really pretty old. In 1989, um, here, let me give you the citation of for this. In 1989, Janice Light developed um, an idea that she called communicative competence. What does it mean if somebody's good at using an augmentative and alternative communication system. And then again, in 2003, she and David Buchelman and Joe Richley uh, published uh, some more information about what does it mean to be competent as a as an augmented communication user. I saw that paradigm and thought, this is perfect for accessible educational materials. It's perfect for assistive technology when we think about what are the things that we need to teach our students in order to make them as independent as possible, help them be as independent as possible um, in their um, assistive technology and accessible educational materials use. So, they, uh, Janice Light and all the other folks that she's worked with over time have proposed the idea that we need operational skills. We need to know how the thing works and which buttons to push and when to push them and, and all that kind of stuff. We also need functional skills. Now, in the Janice Light paradigm, she calls these linguistic skills because she's talking pretty strictly about communication. When I say functional skills, because I modified this paradigm a little bit so that it'll work for AIM, um, what we're talking about is can the student get information from the text or from the, the uh, educational materials that they, are, that they are using? Can they understand? the educational materials that they are using? Can they use that information to um, create products and, and um, demonstrate their learning? So those are the functional skills. We chose, perhaps we chose digital text for a particular student. and But then the question becomes, what are they going to do with that digital text? And it's not just 
play it on the computer. You know, it's not just hit a button and have the computer read a whole page of text aloud to you. There's there's much more involved in using that text in a in a way that demonstrates learning and um, allows for full participation. Another set of skills that uh, Janice Light and uh, has talked about were strategic skills. Those are the skills where we talk about um, when do you use what? What we know, that we sometimes assume that uh, an AIM package, an AIM set of tools and materials for an individual student will will be used in the same way for every single activity. But uh, I think kids with vision impairments are the best example of why kids have to make decisions about which tools they're gonna use when. Um, there's a wonderful video on the CAST website about um, a student who likes to listen to her textbooks in digital format and ha you know uh, have it word word for word by the computer but if she's listening to a novel or a, a nonfiction or a fiction book for a particular um, class like language arts or something like that she'd much rather have an audio reader an adult you know recorded reader so, is it Bookshare or is it Learning Ally is the question that becomes pertinent then. And when do you use which one? I think we need to teach our students to know when they use which tools and have a, a variety of AIM tools in their arsenal. And then finally, social skills. How do we use our accessible educational materials in environments where other people may be doing different things or in environments where people look like they were doing the same thing that we're doing, but may actually, uh, you know, we may be listening to in a different way or reading in a getting information from text in a different way. So how do we do that? I want to encourage you to um, think about a student at this point that you know who uses accessible educational materials. And let's think briefly for each of these areas about what that student might need to learn. Um, I'm gonna ask you to type any ideas you have about your particular student in the chat. So let's start with operational skills. You have students who use, I'm assuming, who use uh, accessible educational materials, or you have students that you would like to use accessible educational materials. For the operational skills in, the, in this paradigm, we're talking about the technical skills that they need to have in order to operate the device or the system associated with AIM. So not only the digital file of the textbook or the teacher made worksheet or whatever, but whatever device it is that delivers that digital file to the student. And it also includes those skills required to use assistive technology and other access methods. So if you're thinking about a student who uses a Braille reader, for instance, there are many skills involved in using those um, AT, that AT, uh, in order to get access to the accessible educational materials. So take a minute, think about a student you know, and I'm gonna open up my chat window. And um, I'm wondering if you would please think of like one, one new skill, because we always have more to learn about a topic, no matter what. So what's the one new skill that a student you know might need to learn in order to be good at operation of their technology? Mm -hmm. 
Brittany, thank you. Just basic stuff. How to turn it on and off, how to access the program, and how to charge it. One of the things we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit is self self determination and self advocacy as it as it relates to aim implementation. And I think that the kind of skills you're talking about are self determination and self advocacy skills that can be taught to our very youngest students. That how to turn it on and off stuff like that. I also see Brittany says, as far as teaching the actual tool use, I love having students who are familiar with the, the tool help each other uh, in using it. Brittany, do you want to unmute yourself and say anything about that? Or I'd love it too. Um, I mean, that was basically it. I know like we use a lot of like one of the district wide tools we have in PPS is like co writer and snap and read and stuff. And so some of the students are really familiar with using it or like there isn't like translation and like reading level changes. And I feel like it's just so much easier, like receiving it. If they see other peers, like, Hey, this is something that really helps me. Um, they just tend to enjoy learning about it a lot more. Absolutely. And I want, I'm going to flip through okay. my slides here because what you're talking about here is really many of the social skills that we we want to use when we're thinking about implementing AIM, what are some of the ways that we can do that? And you've identified a great strategy um, for developing some social skills that not only make it so that the student can learn to operate the device, but also make it understood that lots of people are doing this. It's not just me being a different, a different person. Deb, I see that you said who to contact if they have a technical problem. And that's really, that's a thing that we don't always teach our students or our teachers um, about how to, to move forward when the operation isn't going very well. What do we do to problem solve? So let's do, I'm going to skip the functional skills because you're, you're all thinking about different uh, aim and different assistive technology. And, and I think uh, hopefully this definition using the specific knowledge or abilities for which the aim was chosen, like, is it the science curriculum? Is it the language arts? Is it everything? And is it always the same thing? That's one of the questions. Let's look at strategic skills. Strategic skills are knowing how to decide when to use your aim and, and the ability to choose which aim format to use for assignments. So think about your student or, or other students that you know. And what are some of the strategic skills that you could be helping them learn um, as they move forward in their AIM journey and their AIM implementation. I'm going to be quiet for just a minute. I'll, I'll chime in here. Um, Thanks, Evan. I have a student that it has a lot of physical uh, challenges, and the strategic things are, I think, very important. It's sort of like, okay, for reading, this is what's going to have to be and for math, this is what's half going to be. So each subject area, I've asked the teacher to sort of say, you know, or the assistant that's helping, you know, what is it about when they do that subject that's different um, and choosing, you know, how they're going to do that. Some of it is the preparation beforehand, whether it's the IA setting things up properly um, or the teacher setting up the materials beforehand. Some of the worksheets or handouts the teacher says, oh, we're doing this for all the kids, but for this student, it needs to be changed into the digital format and then some extra boxes added to and she can't write the numbers. So it's like, okay, we're going to give her four numbers to choose from and she's going to have to drag and drop them into boxes and she's got to pick the correct number still from a variety of choices, but those materials need to be set up beforehand, um, specifically 
so that she can access those. So what you just listed was, was a whole bunch of things that have to be done strategically to make it possible for, for her to do one lesson. And I want to go back to this idea that we are asking teachers to change how they teach when we do this kind of work. We're asking kids to change how they learn, but hopefully we're making it easier for them to change how they learn. And I'm also um, challenged with trying to say what part of this is easy for the student to do and maybe not as easy, but is something that they can participate in, whether it be, okay, hand the little QR code so they can hold it and then position the camera in front of the student so that where they're holding it, it lines up and it logs into the computer. And if that's part of the participation of logging into the computer, that's one part that she can participate in, even though she can't necessarily, you know, pick it up out of the box, move it over, put it in front of the camera, but you hand it to her and then position the camera so that it logs itself in. So, the, I'm going to, um, yes, <laughs> I I think here, um, I'm going to skip, skip around a little bit in these slides, because what I, what I think, listening to you, what really strikes me is that I really believe that the skill areas we're talking about, the operational, functional, strategic, and social skills, also apply to teachers. We we assume that teachers will learn uh, learn how to operate and a uh, device, but we assume also that they will be able to help a student operate a device, which is a much higher level of learning. We assume that teachers will know how to teach content to students who are getting their information from an alternate format. And, and that is a whole nother set of skills that we need to, to think about and work on. And then what you talked about is the strategic part of teaching. And my little teacher heart goes a little bit, pounds happily, rapidly. Um, when you start talking about all those things that need to be done, because I'm immediately trying to make meaning out of it. And I'm saying, how are we going to do this? How can I possibly make that happen in a classroom of 30 kids um, when this student needs so much individual attention? Now, I do have answers for that question, but I think it's really important to know that it is for teachers, I believe it's strategic skills that get in the way the most. Um, they understand that they need to operate devices and they understand teaching content, but that strategically how we're gonna make it work in a classroom can be a really difficult idea. Um, I skipped over this slide and I wanna go back to it because we're really proud to announce the uh, publication of the guide, uh, AIM Cohort Student Self-Advocacy Workbook, which uh, covers how to be a self-advocate for your own accessible materials. And it, um, we had it field read by a bunch of middle school kids and we're, we're happy with how it looks, but I want to point out to you that in this guide, we talk about operational skills, functional skills, strategic skills, and social skills. Now we don't say those words, but we do say in this guide, you need to take some responsibility and learn some of these skills in order to be an advocate for your own use of AIM. And it, this is self-advocacy. It's not the only kind of ad, advocacy to see we're talking about, but but um, I just want, I had to put a plug in for it because we're really proud of it. Um, I also wanted to take a real brief mention 
of the National Educational Technology Plan. The, it, it just was released in January. And there's a lot of awareness in this plan. It's kind of heady philosophical government uh, language about how we should use technology in education. But there's a real focus on teaching teachers how to teach with technology in this plan. And I think it has opportunities for those of you who, who do work with your instructional technology people or your curriculum people. You might want to take a look at this plan, and this is the uh, the web address and the and the QR code where you can take a look at it. It's long and um, it's an easy read, but um, the digital use divide is what they talk about when they talk about teachers know how to use technology to, you know, do repetitive tasks and drill and practice kinds of things but maybe not in more creative ways. The other part of this plan does have a whole section on digital access and how there's a, a barrier there for many of our folks with different kinds of access issues, disabilities, but also um, rural areas and poverty and things like that. So I just wanted to mention that to you. But mostly I wanted to get to this big idea, which is AIM must be integrated into classrooms. When we hand off an AIM program of any kind to a teacher or to who, uh, uh, whoever's going to implement it, we have to have some idea about how um, AIM will be integrated into that classroom setting. Because we know that, we remember the SAP framework that we were talking about before, we know that the tasks that the student has to do will change and the tasks that the teacher has to do will change because of the um, integration of AIM. And ideally, they're going to be able to do more and better. But we also are talking about a big change in many of the aspects of the classroom management. Um, so we're going to have to ask questions in our planning ahead of time, like these. What aspects of the student's performance will change? Are they going to be able to read, get information from text faster? Are they going to be able to answer test questions more accurately? Will they be more independent? And you, I'm not going to read you the whole list. But basically, all of these questions get down to, are we looking for a change in the quality of the student's um, performance or the amount that they're able to do? And how does AIM have an impact on that? If you don't have that discussion before you begin AIM implementation, I think you're missing an opportunity to really create a vision for everyone about how the student will um, will perform and what needs to be done. Um, another big picture idea that we talked about at the beginning is that evidence that AIM makes a difference is needed. And I think our planning ahead of time before we introduce AIM into a classroom setting can help us to begin to think about that evidence in a different way and build it into the actual everyday routines and activities in a classroom so that it doesn't become a cumbersome burden with 75 you know, observation worksheets that somebody has to fill out or something like that. So questions like what kind of a change in the way this, will there be in the way the student completes the work? That's basically what tools are they gonna use that are different? Um, what aspects of the student's performance will change? We saw that one um, in the previous slide. And then what data do we need to demonstrate that change is happening or is not happening? And if it's not happening, what do we do about it? Um, again, 
if I believe that these are planning activities that need to happen before we actually begin to do aim implementation and I can hear I can hear you thinking you're thinking oh my gosh there's already so much work to do ahead of time and um now you're asking me to uh to think about more things to do ahead of time to plan but what I will say to you is that if you can do some of this implementation planning up front if you can answer some of these questions, you're more likely to have success and you're less likely to have to go back and do it again over and over and over again. You've all had that experience of, I introduced some new accessible educational materials or some new assistive technology into a classroom. And then I had to go back two weeks later and teach them how to use it all over again. So have, helping build understanding, helping make meaning out of the changes that we hope to see and, and the evidence that we want to collect, I think is a really important skill. Um, another question that I think we have to ask is what changes in classroom procedures and routines will be needed? And this is one that's really focused on the teacher. This is really focused on how, what things does the, does the teacher, the educator, the instructional assistant, whoever it is, need to do in order to make sure that, um, that this aim gets used. So one of the ways to look at classroom routine, well, let's look at what are classroom routines and procedures. So routines are, the activities that teachers and students do every day. You have a routine for lining up to go to lunch. You have a routine for um, everybody get out their Chromebook and read the textbook. You have all kinds of routines that happen in a daily classroom. And Devin, I think the student that you mentioned um, is a really good example about the class may be completing a particular routine, let's say just a regular language arts um, kind of activity that they do on a regular basis. But for a student like the one you described, the routines will have to be changed so that she is able to do those things as independently as possible. And I think it's really valuable and kind of easy to talk about how we're going to change the routines for that particular student. Um, there's another word that's thrown around a lot in the classroom management literature, and that is classroom procedures. Procedures are the step-by-step -step guides that, um, that we use that talk about how students behave, what staff and supporters do, what their peers and partners do, um, and what families do to support a student, an individual student's learning, but but how do we as a group uh, follow those these routines? And I always say that uh, teaching is actually a crowd control activity because you're you're you know trying to keep everybody at least in the same classroom. <laughs> sometimes. So how do we change our procedures help with that? They help students know what they're supposed to do. And we teach procedures. We say, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to do it this way every day. But sometimes procedures don't work for an individual student. So there's all these kinds of procedures that are developed. But let's talk about procedures for uh yeah, Devin says, think of a kindergarten class. The first month of, is teaching procedures, like how to line up. And you go back and you sit down if you didn't line up properly, and then you learn it again. You know, how to raise your hand. Hurting cats comes to mind, Deb, I see. That's absolutely true. Let me show you an example of a student. Um, we did a task analysis of it for this individual student. And this is actually a student that I 
met and got to work with. His name was Daniel. And in his classroom, it was a sixth grade classroom, I believe. Um, he, they had a free reading time. And in that free reading time, everybody went to a book basket, got their book, found there were all kinds of beanbag chairs and, you know, soft furniture in that particular classroom. Um, in those days, they're probably not there anymore, but, um, and they, they, these are the steps you'll see on the left-hand side of what each student knew to do. And the teacher had taught this procedure. So all she had to say was time for free reading and everybody knew what to do. And when she said free reading is over, everybody knew the steps that they were to take um, in, in that also. But Daniel had um, only one hand and it only had three fingers on it and he used a power wheelchair. And um, he could not do most of the steps in this procedure. So what we developed was parallel steps. This is just an adapted routine or adapted procedure for Daniel to do his free reading. It was just a step-by-step -step thing. We did it with the teacher. She had a lot of input on what she thought Daniel should do. And, and we wanted to make him as independent as possible. So you can see that a lot of his stuff was actually using AIM um, for his classroom procedure for free reading. So that's an example of how you might do that. And if you want to go even farther, we won't do it today because we're um, a little short on time, but we could take the operational, functional, strategic, and social skills and fit them into that procedure um, so that we made sure that we were teaching him in each of those areas that we were helping him. The final big picture idea is in this webinar is evidence that AIM makes a difference is needed. So we've already addressed these questions as we did our AIM planning. What kind of a change will there be in the way the student completes the task? What aspects of the student's performance will change? And then finally, what data do we need to demonstrate that the change is happening or not happening? We've used the SEP framework, and we have reset for implementation. As we begin to work more and more with accessible instructional materials, I think the question we have to ask is, how do we make, uh, create an infrastructure to support teachers who want to make that change? I got this kid in my, Daniel's teacher really wanted him to be in her class, to be as independent as possible, and to use alternative materials um, in order to, to learn and to, and to benefit from instruction. She loved that kid. But it didn't come easily until we began to take out and tease out the ways that, um, that he could do things that were in a parallel way to the rest of the kids in the class. Um, I wanna mention there's a couple of slides at the end of this presentation. I was afraid we might not have you know, enough material. Um, so uh, there, you do have two slides about the coherence model, which basically says we have to pull all the dimensions together in order to have a coherent plan for making change. But we're not going to go into that today because we had plenty to talk about. And thank you all for your great participation.